So at this time, I want to take um, a moment to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, Ashley Lebinski has joined us from Cody, Wyoming. She is the Robert W. Woodruff Curator of the Firearms uh, Museum at the Buffalo Center of the West in Cody, Wyoming. She is the first female firearm curator at this prestigious firearms museum in the United States. She hails from the East Coast, where she received a master's degree in American history, studying the perception of firearms in culture. After three years at the Smithsonian Institution's National Firearms Collection, she moved to Cody, Wyoming. In addition to her duties as curator at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, Lubinsky is a firearms consultant for both museums and firearms manufacturers. She is a freelance writer. She's NRA certified as a firearms instructor, an international lecturer, an on-camera firearms historian, and in 2017, she was awarded the prestigious NSF POMA Gritz Greshman Shooting Sports Communicator of the Year Award. So without much further ado, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Ashley Lubinsky. Thank you so much. I always get excited when someone pronounces my name correctly. Uh, it's very complicated. Just so you know, my phone's on airplane mode. I'm just keeping an eye on the time so that Eileen doesn't have to come out here and like push me out of the way because I can talk. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm really excited to be out here. A little backstory, if you're not familiar, I was the guest curator out here um, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, with the Browning Firearms Collection. If you haven't been in to see the temporary gallery, it is an amazing collection. It's the Matthew Browning Firearms Collection. And if you're a firearms person, you recognize that name. Uh, and it's just really amazing that they would have this particular gun collection in this area. And I was telling the docents this morning how excited they should be to be able to interpret that collection because gun people know the Browning name a little bit. And it's, it's, a, it's a neat thing to see, especially in an art museum. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about the connection between guns and art museums because that's, that's definitely a long-rooted history in a little bit. But today I'm talking about displaying the politically incorrect. I put that in scare quotes over there and I'll address why I use the term politically incorrect correct. Um, and the reason that I'm talking about this is because I've noticed as firearms curator and as someone that also talks to the academic community that sometimes with guns, perception is reality. And we all know that perception may not be accurate, but it is what people, you know, they, they believe and they see and they latch onto that. And it can be really hard to kind of pull them away from what they think is true. And then they come into museums with a lot of the things that they've heard or seen in the movies. And we have to find a way as a museum to kind of break down those barriers, break down those obstacles so that people can see the artifacts in the museum for what they are and the diverse stories that they can tell throughout history. So I always like to start out with a question and answer section, uh, not because I'm lazy, but I always like to see you know, what people, uh, I've done this lecture in Chicago and in uh, San Francisco, and so now it's here to Great Falls, Montana. I've also done a, a smaller version of it in Cody, and I'll tell you that I can't get anyone to get most of them right, so don't uh, feel bad when I'm like, no, that's not correct. I'm trying to trick you. All right, what is this? Not a brownie. Thompson, and it's actually not a Thompson. I did this on purpose. Uh, this is a Feltman pneumatic air gun. So it is a toy that was used on, in Coney Island for the Shoot the Star targets. It's a fully automatic air gun, um, but it was used in Coney Island. And I did this because I had an intern uh, several years ago who wrote an article about the difference between semi-automatic technology and automatic technology and you know, machine guns versus you know, semi-auto pistols and that kind of thing. And she posted this as an example of you know, an NFA machine gun. And someone like, commented, is this a joke? And I you know, saw the comment pop up, so I went up and looked and I went, oh no. <laughs> It's, it's one of those things that it looks like a, a Tommy gun, therefore, to some people, you know, 
they automatically assume that that's what that is. And the Tommy gun is also a very misunderstood firearm as well. And uh, this is a, an actual Thompson, I think. <laughs> this is an actual Thompson from the Cody Firearms Museum collection. And uh, it, what a lot of people don't realize is that the Thompson, which everyone calls the Tommy gun or the gangster gun, it's probably one of the most identifiable guns ever in history, was originally made uh, for military and law enforcement use. Now, it was developed, I believe, 1917 by John Thompson, and it was developed too late in the war to be used in trench warfare during World War I, but it ultimately was used in other wars. Uh, but it was the frequent misuse of the Tommy gun by gangsters and then the recreations of those stories in pop culture that make us think about the Tommy gun as this kind of bad guy gun, when it was never intended to be that. It was misused to be that. And so I, I always like the Tommy gun because it's definitely one of those things that people don't necessarily know what the original history is. And as, a, as an aside, has anyone fired a Tommy Thompson? Yeah. You gonna hang outside of a car as it's moving with one arm and do that? Nah. <laughs> Sometimes the movies are real cool, but not technically accurate. <laughs> Which one of these firearms has a high capacity magazine? Now before I say that, I wanna state that there's a lot of different regulations based on states of what that is. We're gonna go with 10 rounds. So which gun has a high capacity magazine by that standard? Both of them. Oh, yay, Montana. <laughs> Score one for Montana. You are correct. The top is a uh, iron-framed Henry rifle developed by Benjamin Tyler Henry uh, in 1860. It was a precursor to the Winchester lever action, and it fires, I believe, 16 rounds, and then below is a 30-round magazine for a contemporary FN-15, which is a semi-automatic modern sporting rifle. Yay, I'm so happy you guys got that. All right, what do these two things have in common? The top thing is a cotton gin, if you don't know what that looks like, as I did not originally. They were both invented by the same guy. Yes. Oh, man, that's two points. Okay, so the, lower, the image of the lower gun was actually made by Eli Whitney Jr., but his father did start um, with the original government contract. Uh, it's kind of an interesting story because Eli Whitney uh, Sr. had gotten the contract uh, to make these firearms, and he almost defaulted on it. It didn't go so well for him, and he uh, gets credit with the invention of interchangeability of parts with the firearms technology, but unfortunately, the original um, test that he did for Jefferson in D.C., because essentially they pulled his butt into D.C. because he was defaulting on the contract, and he was like, wait, 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 okay, so I know I haven't made the guns, but look what I did, and he did this, you know, interchangeable parts, <clears throat> excuse me, demonstration, and he, it was a, it was a run, it was a series, so it wasn't actual interchangeability. A guy named uh, Hall in, in 1816 was able to kind of make the first standard parts, uh, gun with interchangeable parts, so he gets a lot of credit for it, not really. Eli Whitney Jr., though, did a lot better than he did. And we actually have the Eli Whitney Jr. firearms collection at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, which is really neat. And we have several of his personal firearms, which are little sidearms that they made. They only made them for him, but they're, they're kind of a, a neat little tidbit of history. I like to mention the Eli Whitney connection because if you're not a gun person, then a lot of times people think that to, in today's society, that gun people, gun culture, firearms are kind of this thing that's like, over here, especially if you're in a coastal audience, that they're this separate kind of entity and that they don't necessarily inform culture or they only inform it negatively, which is not true. Um, and so I like to pull in this connection to the cotton gin, someone we learn about, you know, when we're in school, and the realization that a good designer, especially in this time period, was also making firearms and that firearms have been integrally linked to our history from the start. And so you can see that different industries, different mindsets come in to inform firearms technology and how firearms technology, like the concept of interchangeability or the assembly line, which they believe inspired Henry Ford, uh, came out of the firearms industry. So they're inextricably linked. What do these two things have in common? That's a muffler. <laughs> yes. Uh, invented by Hiram Percy Maxim, the suppressor on the bottom. Uh, I use the term suppressor because if you've ever fired one, you know that they're not silent. But Hiram Percy Maxim marketed it as the silencer. Great marketing campaign. He had no idea that it would be used against, uh, against the product a uh, hundred years later. But Hiram Percy Maxim also came out with several other uh, muffler, car mufflers, um, and kind of that same concept. He came out with patents um, for cars as well as the suppressor, which we all know and attribute to him today. And one of the interesting things about this is this is a technology misunderstood and kind of gone wrong throughout history because today, with the car muffler, 
it's basically required to have one. And now with the suppressor, which you know was developed for the exact same purpose, is highly regulated. So you can see how that misinformation, thanks James Bond, uh, kind of continues to develop throughout history. We don't necessarily remember why it was developed in the first place, and then what was also being developed by the same guy at the same time, so that they could try to basically ease the noise levels with various and sundry inventions of the time. This is the controversial one. Which one of these is an assault rifle? And I am using assault rifle, so I am talking about the selective fire uh, military gun. That's a single soldier portable, detachable magazine, um, intermediate cartridge, and selective fire. So which one is an assault rifle? No. What's that? I know, I'm a jerk. <laughs> it's the one on the top. There is a switch there, I promise. If you look in real close, it's very blurry. Um, but I do that on purpose. And, and one of the reasons that I talk about uh, assault rifles, and for the docents, you know it was on your list today. Uh, I gave them a vocabulary list, and I'm like, well, it's not like this is going to come up with the collection that you have. But it's one of those things that's really sometimes difficult to understand. Um, the, the, the top gun is a you know, military issue, selective fire uh, weapon, if you will, because it is a military gun, and the bottom is a semi-automatic variant. Um, then there's also the term assault weapon, which is a legislative term that's kind of a catch-all for physical appearances of a semi-automatic gun. And a lot of times when I do this kind of comparison for a museum, I do it because then I throw up another one, which is technically an assault weapon ban approved, which gives me a headache to try to <laughs> figure out which one that exactly is. And I say, you know, which one's which? And I say it's important because one is very, very highly regulated. And if you have it in your museum and you don't have the right licensing, you should probably call the ATF. Um, and so it's important because they look so similar. They are so different and they're regulated differently. So it's important for people, especially people like me who work in museums, to kind of be able to start to identify the difference. But what's kind of scary is that if you can't, then you could make a, you know, if you have a collection item, you could make a mistake when you're accepting it into the museum and not even realize that what you've done, you know, violates federal law. So, kind of important. So, do museums have to pay the same fee? Mm -hmm. uh, at the Cody Firearms Museum, we have a federal firearms license, a dealer's license. We used to have a manufacturing license. Um, and then we also have an SOT so that we can accept registered NFA items. Um, so this right here, and I'll read this, don't worry, uh, this is where the politically incorrect uh, expression comes into play. And I always, I have to apologize because this has now been filmed so many times. NRA Museum, I love you guys. Uh, but this was an article in 2014 published by Yahoo Travel entitled, The 10 Unpolitically Correct Museums That Might Offend You. And making the list were museums concerning racist memorabilia, museums that had dioramic depictions of war crimes, but near the top of the list was the National Firearms Museum, the NRA Museum in Fairfax, Virginia. And um, uh, what it says is, what could be more heartwarming than a visit to the NRA's very own museum, showcasing the development of the firearm, its vital role in American history, and the heroes who blasted their way to fame. Virginia's National Firearms Museum also includes a for the fun of it gallery of recreational guns that jarringly includes a case called a child's room. What I think is really interesting about, well, there's many things that are interesting about how a firearms museum would make it onto a politically incorrect uh, list. And, and the, the thing that made me kind of think about that is that I work with guns every day. I didn't grow up around them, so I sometimes take a different perspective on them. But I almost laughed because I didn't consider firearms to be politically incorrect. And I didn't necessarily, when I started my job, um, I didn't necessarily realize, you know, how controversial they really can be when they're misunderstood in museums, especially when there aren't a lot of people trained in both museums and firearms. Uh, but the other thing that I thought was really interesting about this is something that I see time and time again, which is that you'll hear things that say, you know, firearms are really important, but, and it's that qualifier. Um, I actually was just doing a radio show with a, a woman named Cheryl Todd, and she has a blog out there that says you know, something about, like, don't be a butt. Uh, and she was talking about that qualifier. And in this uh, article, he's saying, listen, these are important to history, you know, but... 
there's this kind of dark side to it, and we don't know if this would be considered appropriate material for a museum. And that's the thing that's really scary to me, because I've got plenty of people that agree that firearms are historically significant, they're pieces of art, but then they always have that but, uh, then they always have this qualifier uh, that makes, that basically renders whatever was said before, you know, pointless, because they've come up with a rationale as to why they don't have it in their museum, or why they don't use it in this circumstance. And so that qualifier is, is incredible incredibly important because this may seem like it's Yahoo travel. You know, it's an online travel blog. Is this really a big deal? Well, the reality is, is that it's happening in the, in the museum world. And, uh, Many years ago in Germany, there was a military conference that was entitled, Does War Belong in Museums? The Representation of Violence in Exhibitions. Now, the answer was yes, so don't worry. But the, the conversation was about how you go, you, how you walk the fine line between the glamorization of war and the sterilization of war. And I think a lot of museums are still trying to figure out how you do that delicate balance. And the problem that comes into this is that when you're talking about firearms, yes, violence can be one part of the story. Yes, there is a violent component to it, but it's only one part of the story. And if you look at the Cody Firearms Museum, you'll see that you know, so many of our guns were made for sporting purposes and were made for reasons that have nothing to do with what we would consider contemporary violence. And so when you can't kind of separate it out and you assume that firearms are all kind of intrinsically associated with that, then you have a serious problem because they're not. And especially an artifact in a museum, I told the docents this this morning, I don't use the term weapon in the museum because they are not to be used as such. Uh, they could be, I mean, they're functioning objects, but we don't like the term weapon in the, in the museum world because weapons imply action. And the firearms that are coming into the museum are not being used as such. So this clicker, if I wanted to throw it at someone in the row, row, second row, it would be considered a weapon. And so because there is that distinction, we try to use the most sterile term possible because there is in today's society with a lot of people an implication of what a firearm is, what it means, and what it symbolizes. And that kind of brings me into this concept of, you know, I, I remember I said in, uh, in uh, Chicago, anthropomorphism. That means you know, attributing human traits on animals and inanimate objects, which is an academic way of saying guns don't kill people, people kill people. Um, and people sometimes roll their eyes at that kind of assertion, but we have a long history of blaming objects for crimes that actually dates back to 1066 in the Roman law of noxal surrender, where essentially if, um, an, uh, if an object was used for something or if you know, your slave, which was considered an object at the time, and even family members, so if you were the head of the family and your son committed a crime, you could actually blame the object in this case, and, and the person would just sacrifice that object. It is a person, I get that, um, in some respects, but they could sacrifice that object, and then the, the head of the household wouldn't be blamed for the crime that was committed under his watch. That concept of, Roman, uh, of noxal surrender then becomes a diadand in England, and it's a, a permissible defense until 1846. And the diadand, and I'm going to read this so I don't screw it up, uh, it put simply is defined as the forfeiture of God. For example, if a man's cart falls and kills another, that object can be blamed and therefore destroyed for the crime rather than the owner of the object. So we blame objects all the time. And everybody always refers to, to different and various and sundry things a, a, a lot of times as an object that is doing, and guns are no different. I do it too. Um, but it's one of those things that it's not new. But then with firearms, today, you think about, can an object be intrinsically bad? And I, I don't believe so, but it can hold a lot of power for someone. So this brings me to this concept of perception versus reality. I mentioned it when I first started. And when we originally tried to start the renovation of our firearms museum, I, I, we, we started with echoing the perception is reality, perception is reality, because a lot of people thought, it's perfect. Why would you change it? And they couldn't see that, you know, there are labels falling down and that the casework is really old and you can get dust in it and that there were, you know, physical things wrong with it, but they believed that it was perfect. And so we had to kind of break down that barrier to get them to see and get behind the project. And so perception is reality. And I study a lot of the different time periods where this kind of comes into play. And one of the bigger uh, moments in our history where we start using guns as metaphor as well as as a physical object is in the post-Civil War period. Um, if you think about the post-Civil War period, it's 
it's rough. <laughs> it's a rough time in our history. You know, 1865, the, the Civil War comes to a close. Uh, you have hundreds of thousands dead. The country is fractured. And, you know, we have the Reconstruction period. People are moving westward. You have a large post-war weapons surplus, which brings about the golden age of firearms manufacture. The National Rifle Association is formed in 1871, um, basically because the Yankees weren't very good shots. Uh, not a lot of people know that, but the NRA was founded in 1871 as a marksmanship unit after the National Rifle Association of Great Britain in 1869, and it turned out to be this really cool like international firearms competition, the Creedmoor matches that happened. It, 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 you think about the 1860s and 70s, where you have all of these different countries coming together to compete in sport. And that was the original um, intent and function of the NRA. And that the same thing that's happening in America is that we're turning into a consumer culture. I had a professor once say, uh, a history professor once say, she always got frustrated with students that would be like, oh, I wish I could live in the 1700s because that professor would be like, you'd die. You would not be able to survive it. You'd die. Um, and, and this professor says that by the 1890s, early 1900s, uh, gilded era into the progressive era, this might be the first time period where if you wanted to live in another time period as a contemporary, where you might have survived. But you probably wanted to wait till the germ was... Uh, realized before that happened. But it is a time where you're starting to see culture evolve into what we know it as today. And so this is a really important time to understand both what's going on and then the perceptions that are growing um, in the use of terminology of firearms. And I'm going to look at my notes here for a second because I don't want to screw this part up because we're going to talk a little bit about history and memory. Uh, a lot of times if I ask someone to recall an event they will recall it, and if I ask them five years from now to recall the same event, they will recall it differently, because the memory memory is a part of the present past. And so it's a really great tool for us to study with oral histories, but you also have to kind of start to confirm whether or not all of those stories can actually have happened the way that that person says. Because anytime we tell a story that's from our memory, we are in a different place, we perceive things differently, and so you kind of have to take those stories with a grain of salt because, uh, well, you might purposefully embellish them, but we won't go there. That's not what this is about. But uh, that great hunting story, right? And uh, this is something that's really interesting because when you move from individual memory to collective memory, that's how you start to create national identity. And in this post-Civil War period, uh, a lot of uh, historians of memory and psychologists of memory and sociologists of memory talk about the fact that memory is often born from um, tragedy. And one of the biggest tragedies in our country was the American Civil War. So for people, the, the concept of memory as a collective is an attempt to turn tragedy into triumph. And so you do start to get this real focused view of American identity, whether it's you know accurate or not, depending on where you live in the country. But the American West kind of becomes that stronghold for people that they look into. And that's why people all over the world always think the American cowboy and Buffalo Bill, who is traveling internationally, is that the American West becomes a symbol for, for many of you know what we can do, where we can go. And so you start seeing people expand. The railroads uh, play a huge role in massive expansion. But then you also see uh, the West depicted in various ways uh, through art, through theater, and of course through Buffalo Bill's Wild West. And so the firearm ends up becoming much more of a symbol um, and metaphor rather than a functional item for a lot of these uh, literary scholars, a lot of these um, artists. They're using the gun to fulfill a purpose. And so a couple of the different ways that they do that, especially in this time period, is firearms as commemoration. Uh, this is a Trump Loy painting. I know nothing about art. I'm just going to say that, so I'm not going to pretend. But Trump Loy, man, I always thought it was really neat. And it's essentially trickery art, and this is William Harnett's The Faithful Colt. I also like Trump Loy because guns appear in it all the time. Um, and what happens in this time period, especially 30 years after the Civil War ends, you get people who are passing away that were a part of it, so they've got their memory that they're sharing forward. But now you've got people that can't remember what the war what happened during the war. They can't grasp onto it. So you get this really large insurgence of collecting and memorabilia collecting. So people want to try to hold on to that past, hold on to that memory, and so they start collecting uniforms. They start collecting firearms for the first time uh, in a large way. And Trump Loy art really capitalizes on that uh, by using guns um, 
from various uh, wars, things that officers would have carried. You'll also see, you know, uniforms with like a bugle, I believe is one of the Trump Loy uh, pieces. And so it, it plays into this importance for people to, you know, commemorate and hold on to their past. And with the commemoration, you also see it uh, as, as people start to interpret the West a, a, and move out there. But the commemoration plays a really big part, and I love it because, you know, gun collecting is a, a wonderful thing for me. And so you can see this birthplace of this love of collecting uh, in American culture uh, because of the, the fading memory of the war. Firearms as moral implication. Um, after the Civil War, or during the Civil War, uh, I'm sure people have seen the photography um, that was done on the battlefield of fallen soldiers. Uh, and a lot of people feel that that's a reflection of the reality of the violence of the war. Um, it is in some respects, but what they also knew is that obviously that soldier did not die with a gun in that position. Um, so they were moving the bodies to get the shots. And photography shots. Um, and so this is a, a, what you would think would be a, a picture of reality, but even this too is altered for a specific purpose behind uh, uh, the reason for the photographer's uh, movement of people. Um, the other thing that happens during this time period is the realism movement in theater picks up. And uh, Chekhov's gun, although not happening in the United States, um, in the 1870s, uh, Chekhov, the literary uh, person, he, he creates Chekhov's gun, which is essentially don't leave a loaded gun on a stage unless you uh, intend to use it. And so they realized that guns could be used in this time period as a, as a manipulation tactic to get people you know, stressed or to get people excited, uh, that, they could, that guns were a powerful thing and that they were, able to be able, they were able to structure the narrative and the intensity of what was going on based on what was on stage. And even today in a lot of theaters, I don't know if you've gone into like a theater and it says, you know, gunfire will be used in the second act. I mean, they even warn you about it in a lot of places because they realize that it can be used um, as a suspense thing, but then also the gunfire can be used to, you know, might jar someone if they're not um, used to firing a gun. And so you have the concept of firearms being used as moral implication. You see it in art as well. And then the other way, so you've got the, almost the yin and the yang here. So you've got guns you know, that are used to make people nervous and for suspense, and then you have guns used in an excitable way, such as in Buffalo Bill's Wild West, depictions in art. Uh, and so the firearm is used in both ways. And I, and I genuinely believe that this yin and the yang, they can't exist without the other if you're trying to use perception. So where some people use it, you know, for, for a negative reason, someone else will use it for a positive reason. And you know, Buffalo Bill, uh, Frederick Remington, Charlie Russell, and uh, Charles Schreivogel uh, is what this picture is. And there's a great article, if you ever want to read it, uh, that the Smithsonian did on, um, it, they called it... Um, uh, the other side of the gun, or gun vision, sorry. And um, it talks about the putting the viewer in the position of being shot and what that means. Um, that's about as far as I'm going to go in the art lesson for this crowd. But you'll see that guns become way more than the tool that we talked about them you know, before. It's, it's a changing of the culture. So you've got all of these perceptions going on. You've got firearms being used for many different manipulation tactics for art and theater and writing. Um, the terminology of guns becomes prevalent in our culture. At the turn of the century, that's where uh, Kodak started using sh shoot and you know point and aim and all the terms that we associate with guns, Kodak appropriated uh, for cameras. And so you see that gun, the gun culture is really kind of taking over in this time period, and it's becoming really what we start to establish as America's gun culture. And when I say that, I don't mean it in the way that you hear it uh, in the news. And there's a lot going on with guns as well, physically during this time period. Uh, there's a larger narrative going on with guns. So you've got all of these people using guns for various reasons, but then you also have guns being uh, made and manufactured in a way that they hadn't been before. And the first uh, kind of important thing is to mention that in 1836, the United States standardizes their patent process. Prior to that, they had a patent process, but it sucked. So they were um, taking patents out, designers taking patents out in other countries. And in 1836, uh, February of 1836, Sam Colt takes out his first revolving patent in the United States. And that's really important because then he owned the legal right to make that and so people had to kind of do things to get around the patents and it really fueled the birth of firearms innovation in the country uh, starting in that period and then as we rev up into the American Civil War production you know expands exponentially and so after the war you've got this post-war weapons surplus and the post-war weapons surplus served a couple of uh, re 
a couple important points for this period, which is that soldiers could take a gun home for six bucks. There were some guns that they could take home for cheaper, but you could take your firearm home from the war at, for six dollars, and then you could use it. A lot of them cut it da- cut them down, and they used them for hunting purposes, or they kept them, you know, as a piece of, as a commemorative uh, of their time to remember their time. And so you get soldiers who are owning these guns, but then also it was cheaper to try to design a new piece of firearms technology if you use the lock, stock, and barrel of an existing gun. And so you'll see a lot of guns like this one up there, that's a musket, it's a Springfield musket, percussion musket, rifled musket used during the American Civil War. Um, That one was often modified, actually I'm sorry, that is the modified version of it. I should look at the picture before I talk. Uh, That is the modified version of it. So you have this Springfield rifled musket and then a guy named Erskine Allen who was a designer for Springfield, he then took that musket which was originally loaded down the barrel and he found a way to load it, uh, I have a pointer right here at the breech of the barrel and it's a trap door feature so it lifts up and you're able to load the gun behind so you'll see all these different variations of the trap door um, spring fields that are used the 66 was actually how William F. Cody earned his nickname Buffalo Bill Uh, the 73 was a standard uh, infantry arm of the US military and so you'll see that it's a old gun new concept so it allows this innovation to really accelerate because they're not having to start from scratch Um, The gun below that is a military uh, issue Spencer carbine. The Spencer was a uh, manually operated lever action, so that meant you worked a lever, but it wasn't like a Winchester where if you worked a lever, then the round loaded in, you had to manually cock the hammer back so that you could fire the gun. But these were actually modified after the war, so they were popular cavalry guns. They were then stripped of their round barrels, an octagonal barrel was put onto it, uh, and they were used for hunting purposes out in the American West. A really popular... uh, um, a really popular gun maker called the Hawken Brothers, who developed a really uh, popular mountain man's gun, the big, big, heavy, long gun. Well, the last owner of the Hawken Brothers, John Philip Gemmer, actually took these uh, Spencers and he stripped them, put new barrels on them, and they were originally called Hawken Spencers. So it doesn't get more Western than that. So you see these people who are able to build upon what had already been done and they can do it for cheap which is always good if you're trying to kind of find a way to do the next cool thing without spending a lot of money. Then of course we have the brand names. This is a time period where yes Colt was pre-Civil War Smith & Wesson, uh, pre-Civil War um, they became way big afterwards but uh, Remington uh, I can name names all day but all of these major manufacturers that we associate with the American West, we associate with America, we associate with firearms manufacturing really become great marketers in the late 19th century and they start to build these marketing campaigns that have you know the Winchester as the gun that won the West. Although I will say you know that thanks to a guy named Edwin Pugsley who'd become the vice president of Winchester Uh, and when he was just a nobody in the company in 1919 he suggested that they use this expression gun that won the West in a marketing campaign and it stuck. Um, So you see these guns and you associate these names with the West and so they start to become a, a major power player in our culture at that time and we start seeing the marketing campaigns of the consumer culture grow and you'll see that they market to men and women. Uh, There's a lot of uh, ad campaigns that are geared towards women during this time period. Uh, This is also a a period of art with the firearm. Now, people have been embellishing guns as long as guns have been around. Uh, Why wouldn't you want to make something pretty? And, uh, but what happens is, is when you get the assembly line production, you get mass manufacture, when you're cranking out all these things that look the same, guess what happens? People want their guns to look individual again. And so Winchester Colt, most of the gun manufacturers in the late 19th century, they open their custom shops so that people can have engraved firearms, they can have, you know, pretty much whatever they want with embellished firearms so that it can be personalized, it can be something that they're able to kind of brag about and show off as an aesthetic piece in addition to being the tool. So you've got embellishment and then you also have the birth of modern technology. How many people knew that the semi-automatic pistols and semi-automatic rifles that we hear about today were invented in the 1880s? 
Um, so modern technology invented in, in this time period. And that is a Gatling gun. Uh, if you were here earlier this morning, you, this will be redundant. I apologize. It's not a machine gun. Uh, a lot of people think the Gatling gun is a machine gun. It is not. Um, but the Gatling gun was developed 1861, patented in 62, was used in trench warfare at the end of the Civil War, but really was kind of one of those items that even though it was uh, um, a brilliant technological um, invention, Hiram Maxim invented the machine gun not too much longer after that, so the technology was drastically changing. Um, I say Hiram Maxim, he was not Hiram Percy Maxim who invented the suppressor, but in the same family. So you get the development of machine guns, you get the development of semi-automatic technology and automatic technology. And for those who are not familiar with the words I'm saying, uh, semi-automatic means that every time you press the trigger, it fires one round. Um, and then automatic is every time you press the trigger, it fires as many rounds uh, as it can until either you release the trigger or you run out of ammunition. The second happens more often than the first. Um, and so you get really this birthplace that sets the standard for gun manufacturing for the rest of you know, our, our history and culture. So all of these things are happening in this time period. We're getting a growth in American sporting culture. As I said, the NRA is founded. There are people on Sundays going to shooting matches and the, the sport of shooting becomes baseball before baseball becomes popular. So this is a time when we're not only using guns as tools and as military weapons, but we're using them for sport, we're using them as aesthetic pieces, and we're seeing them used and manipulated through metaphor and symbol. So a lot of things are going on right now, and I could probably talk for another three hours on everything that goes on, but this is important because it starts to develop how we see guns as we come into the 20th century, especially when movies become even more popular, uh, the gangster era, and the start of these federal regulations on firearms. The 1960s is another really um, drastic transition for how we perceive firearms. And while the perceptions can be really interesting and fascinating, they're not always accurate. And so as a, as a museum professional, as a historian, we see it, we need to be able to kind of break away and to break away from those perceptions, we have to understand where they came from. And this is a huge period where that happens. So to switch over to the museum segment of this, um, I've been doing a lot of research on various museums. I'm a consultant, uh, so I worked for this museum. I'm working for several other museums. And I find that trying to balance visitor expectations when they come into the museum with all these preconceived notions of guns can be really difficult for us to interpret them. And I think historically, gun museums have functioned as art museums. They come out of being a part of art museums. And so they are often object-driven uh, institutions where you see guns and fans and ornately designed but they don't necessarily tell the story of what's going on. And so you get kind of this, what I, to not sound too technical, this in-group, out-group mentality with guns. So I walk into the Cody Firearms Museum. I've been studying guns for 10 years, and I can go in and look at all of the pretty guns and go, oh, okay, so that's connected to Eli Whitney, and it serves this purpose in our history, and then it informed this thing, so I can make all these connections. My mom walks into the Cody Firearms Museum not knowing anything about guns, and she, her first reaction coming out of that was, oh, cool, you guys have a lot of guns. <laughs> She didn't have that big takeaway that the people that are in the know, us, you know, us gun geeks or us gun enthusiasts, we get it. And so we can go into gun museums and like our minds are blown because, that's a horrible expression to use, but we're always, you know, we're really into all the different variations and designs uh, of the firearms because we get it. We get why guns are important. Well, at the Cody Firearms Museum, we are a part of five museums, uh, and we get international visitors that are on their way to Yellowstone. So there is a large percentage of people who wander into the Firearms Museum that just paid their admission to go to the Art Museum, and because they're there, they're like, oh, cool, well, there's a gun museum. I'll go in and see what, that, what, what that's all about. And so what we're trying to do in our museum, and you guys have an opportunity here as an art museum with a gun collection, is that you can help people who don't necessarily know about guns um, understand why they are important to history. Now, I always say that my job as a museum professional is not to make you love guns. Um, my job is not to make you come out of the Cody Fires Museum being like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get a gun in every color and I'm going to learn to shoot and I'm going to do all these things. 
If that's your takeaway, awesome. I'm a firearms instructor, uh, and so I'd be happy to teach you. But that's not my job. My job is for you to understand that why and to be able to draw your own conclusions about how you feel about guns, how you feel about the technology, how you feel about the culture from an informed basis. And so we're trying to do better in the Cody Firearms Museum. And like I said, at the Russell, you guys have a great gun collection that gun enthusiasts are going to love to come see, and you can cultivate them by bringing them in and showing them all the different facets, but then there can be a bigger kind of contextual narrative for people that don't understand it. Uh, I said to the docents earlier today, don't try to pretend to know gun information when you come into the gun gallery, because trust me, a gun person will tell you when you're wrong. Um, but you can find a way to connect it to Charlie Russell, to the American West, to the hunting pictures you see depicted, to Native American culture. You can find ways that you know about to connect to guns. I always say, I promise you, if you come into the Cody Firearms Museum with me, even if you think you have no connection to firearms whatsoever, I can find something in that museum that you can relate to. Um, and that's really what, what we're trying to do. But unfortunately, because there, like I said earlier, there are not a lot of um, museum professionals that are also uh, trained in firearms, you get a lot of different ways to interpret them. And when I wrote my research survey for this collection, I kind of separated them out into bigger thematic categories. Uh, this is the, the most common in a history museum. This is uh, storytelling or the contextual method. Uh, don't make fun of my titles. I know they're terrible, but uh, they get the point across. So storytelling, if you're in the Smithsonian's American History Museum and you walk into a military uh, gallery, you, you're going to see uniforms and you're going to see all different types of ephemera that are associated with that time period, and guns are a part of that. And so they're uh, a little piece of a bigger story. Or at the Autry, They've done something in their gamble gallery where they'll have a gun and then they'll have a big text panel and it'll be like the Kentucky rifle. That's not a Kentucky rifle. That's just a cool picture. But um, you'll have a Kentucky rifle. And so they will have layers of education for different people. And so it'll say, you know, talk about early expansion in the West. And then it'll bring it down to the American long rifle. And then it'll bring it down specifically to that gun so that people can start to see the big picture funneled all the way down into the technical information that a gun enthusiast would want to know. So history museums, if the mission of your museum is to tell a particular time in history, it's not just going to be guns, it's going to be a lot of things because they're integral to that history. Gun on wall, or the artistic method. Uh, I call out the Cody Firearms Museum on that one. Uh, and that's one thing that you'll see most often with gun displays, which is you'll see a lot of guns on the wall and very little context, unless you want to read a really long text panel. And I'm going to be honest, I'm like the worst museum professional ever. Like, I want to be able to walk in and get it. You know, I want to have something that kind of indicates what's going on so that I don't have to read every single label because I've got 4,000 guns on display in the Cody Firearms Museum right now. You're not going to be able to read every label. And so with this method, it can be great for the enthusiast, but overwhelming for the average visitor. I always challenge people to find me the two Custer guns in the Cody Firearms Museum, or to find me, you know, some Henry Ford's Winchester Model 1887, because it's in a row of guns and it's not pulled out. So these are great ways to tell certain stories with guns, especially with artistic guns. So an art museum will take that methodology, and they're the ones that started with this, and they'll have an embellished arm. So it'll be this gorgeous piece of art, and they'll display it in a way, and it doesn't necessarily need you know, all the context because it's you know, to be looked at, it's to be appreciated aesthetically. But what the gun museum does is it takes, instead of just embellished arms that they're trying to highlight, it takes the utilitarian and then crisscrosses them and really makes a lot of people trying to study the gun mad because their shadow is being cast on them and they can't see it. Uh, visible storage. Now, this is kind of the Cody Firearms Museum answer to a lot of issues with the fact that we want to display our collection. We have over 8,000 guns in the entire center, and I believe that if you got an encyclopedic collection, you got to show it. So how do you balance making it not overwhelming for the average person? One way to do that is through a study gallery. This is our study gallery, where if you, um, you know, are a Model 70 guy, then you can, or girl, uh, you could come in and you could pull that rack out, you can see both sides of the gun, you can get really up close with it, and you can study the changes of it. So you can have a balance of a lot of guns that are visible, things though that you can pull out, because those racks right there, that, uh, with that square footage, if you had guns just lined up in a linear fashion, you'd get about 150. There are 500 guns in that case. So it definitely uh, allows you to showcase what you've got. 
But what I see, sorry, CM Russell is a picture of your museum, but not this current installation. Uh, what I see a lot with museums that have gun collections is what we call firearms as separate or the segregation method, which is you don't have someone on staff that knows you know, about guns or knows how they can connect them with the bigger mission. So they kind of just put it in a corner and they're like, we have this collection, but we don't know what to do with it. And we know it should be showed, but we don't know how to interpret it. That happens a lot. And so when I first came on as curator, I'm sure you guys all remember, it was in the front gallery there. And so what we've tried to do in the temporary space is we still have the guns you know, lined up for people that want to see them, that know about the guns, but then we make the connections to the Russell so that they can start to realize that there's a bigger narrative going on. But then the one that makes me the saddest it is happening more and more often and happens, um, has been happening is uh, the fact that guns, I call it guns is, are invisible, which is that they don't want guns to be a part of their narrative or they don't know how to safely handle them, which is certainly an understandable reason behind that. Um, and so they don't showcase guns. This is a quote from um, the former director of MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, that says, deadly weapons are among the most fascinating and well-designed artifacts of our time, but their beauty can be cherished only, for the, only by those for whom aesthetic pleasure is divorced from the value of life. A mode of perceptions the arts are not meant to encourage. It's that qualifier come full circle. You see it in the pop culture reference with Yahoo Travel, and then you see it with an academic institution believing that they can admit that guns are really you know, well designed, but you know, they're this violent entity and you can't you know, display them unless you this bad person. And that mentality is sad because there are so many stories that you can tell with firearms throughout history, whether you like them or not. And it's a shame to see some organizations take the stance that they won't. Now, I think that they have had a gun exhibit since he was director, but um, it, it's happening and it happens more often than you'd think in a lot of these institutions because they just don't know how to have the conversation. They have this misperception about the guns. So if the people who are supposed to be the objective bearers of history, which you know, we all know objectivity is not possible, but if you have uh, these people who are supposed to be telling you the history as it is and then they're choosing to not show you something in it, I mean, that can be a really sad thing for the artifact and a sad thing for people not being able to get kind of the whole story and draw their own conclusion. So we're working at the Cody Firearms Museum, and don't, I don't expect you to be able to read that, uh, to, to find a way to fix that problem, do better uh, in a ways. And, and you guys have uh, done an amazing job at the Russell, you know, trying to do better by your gun collection. You recognize that it's this really historically significant collection and that it does tie into the Charlie Russell narrative and it does tie into the American Western narrative. And so I think it's awesome and I applaud you guys for recognizing that and trying to find a way to incorporate. And at the Cody Museum, we're doing uh, the same thing. And I won't go through all that because it's kind of mundane, but the, the one piece that I think is really important that I'm going to mention on here is that I'm really excited I have a laser pointer I should have used it more uh, this piece right here this is our overall timeline for the museum and that is what we also call the fast track so if you don't have a lot of time we recognize you might not give your full two days or day or three hours to the firearms museum you can walk in and get the beginning of firearms history all the way up to today and walk back out. But what we're doing with this is something that no gun museum has done yet, which is that we all talk about evolution. We talk about match locks to wheel locks to flint locks to percussions. If you think I'm speaking gibberish, that's okay. But how the technology changes. But we don't talk about why it changed. So on this timeline, people will be able to, to see what's going on in history at the time. What did this inform? What did we learn from this? You know, what, what different things were going on to change how we, func how we used firearms, how we perceived firearms. Um, you know, one of the things that I always like the connection with mass manufacture of the world wars is all the companies like Rocola jukeboxes that were making firearms because you had to ramp up production. So finding those ways to tie in those things that may, might make you go, huh, I didn't know those people were involved in that, or I didn't know that Sam Cold inspired Henry Ford, so that you can start to tie that in. And at the beginning of that uh, evolution gallery right here is a fully hands-on interactive space for people who don't know about guns. Because if you don't know about guns, you don't know what a rifle is. You don't know what uh, a pistol necessarily is or a carbine. Um, and so that terminology that people know, they come in, if you're reading the labels, you're already out because you don't know what they're saying. So this way you can get hands-on with the guns, you can work action types, you can learn about the terminology, you can learn about how they operate so that when you walk into the museum, you feel like you get it a little bit more and you're not so overwhelmed. And we also have a simulated shooting experience that'll be in the front um, that'll teach you about firearm safety, that'll teach you about the proper way to grip and sight your gun so that they can get hands-on because I feel like so often with 
guns, uh, especially if you've never held them before, there's this kind of air of, I don't understand it, it makes me nervous. And so if you can kind of break that barrier in a safe way, um, then people might feel more comfortable to learn about them, interact with the rest of the museum. So that's some of the things that we're trying to do because in my experience, you want to make sure that your history is being told, your entire history is being told. And firearms are a really important part of that, but I feel like for various reasons, whether it's a purposeful choice not to have guns for whatever it is that your political or your moral you know, reasoning behind that is, or just you feel overwhelmed and you don't know about the technology or you feel like you're going to sound stupid. Stupid. Hey, man, I'm sure I sounded stupid several times tonight. You know, it, it gives you that opportunity to kind of step up and feel like you're getting it in a good environment. Because if we don't do this, then the guns are going to continue to get vaulted. They're going to get, continue to not be told in the story. And we're really losing a really important artifact in American history that we can kind of continue to use and tell into the future. Thank you.